If you would like to appear on an episode of My Story Living with Lupus, you can contact us at mystorylivingwithlupus at gmail.com. Also visit us on our Instagram page and also our website, My Story Living with Lupus. The views and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lucas podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks, and I'm so glad that you could join me on this Friday, September the 25th, 2020. Hey, today I'm going to be telling you about the time I was in a flare A real, real severe flare. And I had to go to the hospital here in Detroit. And, you know, the intake nurse screwed up all my information. And I got locked up in the psych ward. That's right, the psych ward based on the medications that the rheumatologist placed me on to control the symptoms of the flare. That's right. Also, we're going to be discussing drug-induced lupus and how um, this one particular medication Hydrochlorothiazide put a patient in an induced state of systemic lupus erythematosus. It's a case study. So, you know what I want you to do all the way from the United States to Australia. That's right, grab your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, and to my listeners late at night, You know I appreciate you. So grab your favorite glass of wine and come on and listen to the crazy story and the situation I went through going to the ER for a severe lupus flare. And just come on and listen right here on My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. benefits of apple cider vinegar. Now you guys know that I'm a vegan and that I have lupus along with other health issues. I used to take ACV every morning before I worked out, but eventually the taste of ACV got to me and I had to look for another alternative. And that's when a friend of mine turned me on to Goli. Goli is the first apple cider vinegar gummy. They give you all the benefits of ACV 
without the taste. That's right. Goalie is vegan, gelatin-free, gluten-free, and 100% organic. And the vitamins and the ACV in Goli promotes a healthy heart by maintaining a healthy cholesterol range, controls blood sugar levels, and also curbs your appetite. And the best part about Goli, for every sale generated, a child in need receives a six-month supply of essential vitamins with vitamin angels. So if you don't believe what I'm saying, I'm going to give you some information so you can try Goli for yourself. Here's a promo code you can use. It's Sue Lynn One. That's S U E L Y N N E One. And you'll receive 5% off of your initial purchase. Also, I'll leave a link in the description in the podcast so why don't you go and try it for yourself you won't believe how good it tastes that's goalie Do you have your cup of coffee? Do you have your cup of tea? Do you have your favorite glass of wine? I hope you do. And if you're drinking that wine, pour a glass and drink it for me. Because this story I'm about to tell you that happened to me um, when I was initially diagnosed with systemic lupus, will blow you away because I was sitting down this week and I was thinking about all the crazy things that have happened to me. Um, because of being diagnosed with lupus. The crazy things that I'm talking about from people being scared to touch me because they think that they could catch lupus from my touch to people who don't, well, didn't want to sit beside me because they thought if I coughed or sneezed that they could catch it like that. And the craziest story of them all is when I was in a severe lupus flare, which triggered the fibromyalgia. So I was receiving pain from the lupus and pain from the fibromyalgia. This had happened on a, um, had to have been a Friday. And I had been in pain all day and the pain had become so intense where at this point in time I could not take myself to the ER. I had to um, call a girlfriend and ask her, hey, Come and get me. I'm in a severe pain. And um, she did. She got over there quick. And the reason why, if you're wondering, well, why didn't you call your family? Well, my mother was at the end stage of her life. And 
I didn't want my family to know what I was going through at the time. So we got to the hospital and um, I go in, gave them my information. The nurse asked for my list of medications and diagnosis, gave it to her, and out of her mouth comes, you suffer from depression? I stated, no, the medication that you were referring to is used to control the symptoms of the lupus and the fibromyalgia. I I told her, rheumatologists prescribe um, seizure medication along with antidepressant medications to control the symptoms of both. I never heard of that. That's what her reply was to me. And I told her, well, we learn something new every day, don't we? And so she went in and, you sure you don't suffer? Now, this is how she's talking to me, and I'm in severe pain. You sure you don't suffer from no depression? I said, ma'am, if I had mental issues... I wouldn't be ashamed to say it, but I said, I have no mental issues. So she takes me back and I'm looking around. I'm in a wheelchair looking around. And I said, well, why can't I go over here? No, you're going over here in this room over here. And something told me, say, keep your wit, keep your senses. Um, Don't let them give you anything. So I went there waiting and waiting. And I'm looking around at the patients. And I said, something's not right. I said, these patients are screaming. They are tied down to her bed to their bed. I said, now what's going on? Lo and behold, I was in the psych ward. She had placed me in the psych ward based on not my diagnosis, but based on the medication which was prescribed by the rheumatologist to control the symptoms of the fibromyalgia and the lupus. Now, I was on hydroxychloroquine. We know that we know that as Plaquenil. I was also on an um seizure medication gabapentin and I was also on Cymbalta to um control the symptoms of the fibromyalgia. Now, with the fibro um myalgia, you know there is very little medications that um they can give you for that. But they do prescribe antidepressants um, for the fibromyalgia and it deals with the serotonin and, and serotonin uptake and all of that but this nurse failed to realize that That medication can be used for other things besides what it is meant to be used for. Yes, there's Lyrica for the fibro treatment. But at the time, um, I don't think Lyrica was out. And um, so the doctor prescribe the antidepressants. Now, 
they help ease the pain and the fatigue, but this time it wasn't working. And the anti-convulsants, um, which are seizure medications, may also help reduce the pain. So I was on anti-convulsants, that was the gabapentin, and antidepressants, which was the Cymbalta for the pain, to try to reduce the pain of the flares and the fibromyalgia um, pain. But she didn't know anything about that. So it was a medical error on her part. Um for not going by the list of diagnosis and she just took it upon herself that anyone to come into the medical facility must have mental health issues. And like I stated, if I had mental health issues, I wouldn't be ashamed to state it. But this one particular nurse, she was gung-ho and she was young. And I had stayed in that lockdown area for about one hour. I had patients coming up to my bed who were, who had gotten, um, who had gotten the loose from, um, um, how can I say it? I can't think of the medical terminology now, but who were tied to the bed. That's the best way I can put it. Who had gotten loose on their own and was walking around while the nurses sat back in um their office just watching until a physician I used to work with came in. And he passed by my bed and he said, Susan, and I turned and I said, yes. He said, what are you doing here? I said, doctor, and I said his name. I said, you know, I have lupus along with fibromyalgia. He said, yeah. He said, why they have you locked down in the psych ward? There's nothing wrong with you mentally. He said, who? brought you in here and I said she did and he said it's nothing wrong with her mentally she has lupus along with underlying conditions such as fibromyalgia he took a list look at the medications I was on and he said don't you know that these medications are to help her with the pain of what she's going through right now, he said, get her her clothes, get her belongings, get up off your behind, and get her out of here. If it had not been for that physician I used to work with coming by and saying that I was in there, they would have tried to give me medication for something that I had not been diagnosed with. Don't you know, people, that the third leading cause of death is medical errors? It's estimated that as many as 98,000 people die in any given year from medical errors. And yes, this was a medical error. When I got up, he waited on me. When I got my belongings, he said, Susan, I will make sure that you're taken care of. I said, no. I said, no, doc, this is what I'm going to do. 
I said, I'm going to leave out of here, but I used another phrase and I refuse to come back to this hospital for anything, even if I'm on my last breath. I refuse to come back here. I said, I'm getting my stuff and I'm headed to the suburbs. And that's where I went. I went directly to the suburbs. My girlfriend asked me, she said, what's wrong? I said, they had me locked up in the psych ward. She said, for what? I said, based on the medications that the rheumatologist prescribed me to control the pain of the lupus and the fibromyalgia. She said, well, I be doggone, but she used another word. She said, we out of here. And she took me to a hospital out in the suburbs. And by the time I got there, they had to get a stretcher to come get me out of the car. And I was admitted into the hospital for um, the lupus. I was in full-blown lupus and fibromyalgia flare. I stayed in the hospital for like five days. And I, you know, when I got in there, I explained to them what had happened. And that, I mean, y'all, I was in such severe pain, the kind of pain where I was saying to myself, oh God, save me. That pain is one of the worst pains that you could ever feel. Um, My uh, blood pressure had elevated. Um, I, the only thing that I could say I could do was just ball up in a knot and they had to give me morphine and that was the only thing that um was helping was the morphine and being hospitalized i had become dehydrated um the combination of the lupus pain along with uh fibro pain it just it it ran me. I thought I was going going to go crazy, and I remember one gentleman who heard me moaning. He said he peeped his head over. He was there with his wife, and he said, "I feel so sorry for you." He said, "My daughter has the same thing you have." And it's nothing that can be done. He said, honey, my prayers are with you. He said, I can feel your pain. I know what you're going through because I watched my daughter go through it. And I told him, thank you. But that, that was that was it. That was my story of being locked up in the psych ward based on medications that was prescribed for by the rheumatologist for the pain of the fibro and the lupus. I was on anticonvulsant and I was on an antidepressant and they were trying to, the rheumatologist was trying to, um, control the pain and that is one reason why now when I go through my flares um, I don't go to the emergency room Mm -mm. the only time I go to the emergency is for my heart I grin and bear the flare ups And you will hear most individuals with lupus to say that um, they rather stay at home and fight it off 
then go into the emergency room. The emergency room for some of us is the last resort because there's still that stigma of that. um, We're just looking for drugs. So I, I, like I said, the only time I go to the emergency room is for my heart. Besides that, I sit it out with the lupus flare-ups, with the fibro flare-ups, with all the other underlying conditions. Now my heart, yep, I'll get up, get out, quick and in a hurry, and tell them to call 911, and I'll be popping my nitroglycerin quick and in a hurry to stop the chest pains. But that is the only time that I will go to the emergency room. Besides that, I'll sit at home and grin and bear it. When we come back, we'll be talking about a case study when chest pain reveals more a case of hydrochlorothiazide induced systemic lupus arrhythmatosis stay with me You know, those of us with lupus experience hair loss, thinning hair, either from the illness or the medication we take. I have the perfect solution for you. It's called Vitalize. Yes, Vitalize can help you. They are in the business of growing healthy hair. They have a hair system that can help you, and even better, they have a new and improved edge control gel. That's right, ladies. There is no flaking. It lays down the edges and also protects it from heat. But wait one minute. Most importantly, the edge control has the award-winning hair growth ingredient retinin saw. Addition to the three-part scalp treatment system, there is a silk pillowcase for you to lay those growing locks on. Shampoo, conditioner, and multivitamin gummies. You can see reduced shedding in two weeks. You heard me. And most See results in four. To see proof for yourself, go on over to VitalizeHair.com. That's V-I-T-A-L-I-Z-E-H-A-I-R.com. And use the referral link listed in the information box on this podcast. Now, to understand or to better understand what is drug-induced lupus, we know that lupus is a condition that can happen when your body's immune system attacks your healthy tissues and organs. Drug-induced lupus is when it's caused by taking certain prescriptions for months or years at a time. Now, while lupus may damage your kidneys or lungs, drug-induced lupus rarely affects your body's major organs. It's also temporary. 
Once you stop the medicine that causes it, symptoms usually clear up within a few weeks or months. Now, you are more likely to get drug-induced lupus if you're age 50 or older. Which drugs cause drug-induced lupus? Well, hydralazine, which is used for high blood pressure. Drugs used to treat tuberculosis. Um, Drugs to treat infections and acne. Procanamide, which is used to treat heart rhythm problems and quinidine which treats, um, also treats heart rhythm problems. Now, many groups or classes of drugs are linked to this disease, which includes antibiotics, medicines to treat fungal infections, high blood pressure meds, as stated before, medicines to treat inflammation, arthritis medications, and medicines to treat seizures. Now, not everyone who takes these drugs will develop drug-induced lupus. Now, the symptoms, they're similar to regular lupus. They may include muscle pain, joint pain, fever, tired, feeling, weight loss, inflammation around the lungs or heart that causes pain or discomfort. You may also feel these as soon as three weeks after you start taking the drugs, but usually it takes from several months to two years of regular use before you have the symptoms. Now, there exists a case study, and here is the background. Drug-induced lupus erythematosus is considered an autoimmune entity, which is precipitated by medications. Hydrochlorothiazide has been recognized to cause subacute cutaneous lupus erythematosus. But very few cases of systemic drug-induced lupus, systemic erythematosus, has been reported. Now, the case report is as follows. A 57-year-old Caucasian male with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia presented with reconcurrent fevers, chest pains, and dyspnea. Initial evaluation revealed diffuse ST elevations inflammatory drugs, and prednisone for pericarditis. Six months later, he reported fatigue, morning stiffness, weight loss, fevers, and night sweats. Laboratory tests reveal persistent anemia and leukopenia, extensive workup, including bone marrow biopsy and infection evaluations were negative. Now, autoimmune workup, however, revealed a positive anti-chromatin antibodies despite negative anti-nuclear antibodies, a diagnosis of drug-induced lupus secondary to hydrochlorothiazide was made. 
the medication was stopped and prednisone was initiated, resulting in marked improvement in his symptoms and hematologic abnormalities. Conclusions. This report is one of the few known cases of systemic lupus erythematosus, most likely induced by hydrochlorothiazide. Based on the findings, hydrochlorothiazide should be considered a possible offending agent when a patient presents with symptoms suspicious of drug-induced lupus. Now, you know, a lot of us, or I should say some of us, um, suffer from high blood pressure and you may be on hydrochlorothiazide, which is also a medication to treat high blood pressure. And most people who take hydrochlorothiazide are on this medication for years, but may be exhibiting symptoms such as lupus. And and when they go to the doctor, they just don't know what is going on. And when the doctor does the workup, it is finally revealed that the patient is suffering from drug-induced lupus from the medications. That's why I tell you, well, I've stated on previous um, podcasts, it is so important for you to ask the doctor about the side effects of the medications that you're taking. Um, Just don't say, okay, um, I'll take it and just, you know, be through with it. No. Be sure you know what side effects of the medication is because it can if you have lupus it may be adding to the symptoms of your lupus you get what i'm saying and for those who are on high blood pressure medication ask your doctor what is the long term symptoms if I take this medication? What damage could it do? And all the are there alternatives for me to not take the medication? But there are drugs out there that can cause people to go into a state of drug induced lupus. And while I'm talking about this, I really do believe that my sisters always, I have one sister that I call a hypochondriac because if I'm not feeling good, she'll ask me, what are your symptoms? And I'll tell her then the next thing you know, oh, I got the same symptoms as you do. But she's on high hydrochlorothiazide and when she she has to make her doctor's appointment I'm going to tell her to ask her doctor could she be in a drug induced state of lupus by taking this medication and let them do the workup um, request a workup on her and if it comes back that she is in a drug induced state then it should be an alternative, another alternative medication for her to take. And also I'm going to check with my my brother and my other sister because I do believe that they're on hydrochlorothiazide also. So that 
is the case study regarding the drug-induced lupus. Stay with me. I have some more for you. You know, I wanted to run something by you. Um, And I want to discuss um, tennis champion and great Venus Williams. You know, she suffers from an autoimmune condition called Sjogren's syndrome. Now, a lot of us who have been diagnosed with lupus have Sjogren syndrome. And to all my new listeners and followers, first of all, let me say thank you. But I want to explain to you exactly what Sjogren's syndrome is. And it really came to the headlines when Venus Williams declared she was suffering from it. Sjogren's is what doctors call a chronic systemic autoimmune disease. It's when the body's immune system mistakenly attacks itself, leading to healthy tissues being destroyed. It's chronic because it lasts for a long time. And systemic as it affects different organs. It can occur on its own when it's known as primary Sjogren's syndrome or with another autoimmune condition such as lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, or systemic sclerosis, and is then called secondary or associated Sjogren's syndrome. Like the majority of most autoimmune diseases, there is no cure. Now, what are the symptoms? The most common symptoms arise when immune cells known as lymphocytes attacks the body's own saliva and tear glands. This leads to the body producing fewer tears and less saliva. The so-called SICA syndrome. Now, as for myself, I have to um, have the left submandibular gland taken out because it became infected which is a saliva gland. Also, I have plugs in my tear ducts. I also use restasis for the dry eyes. Now, it's common that fewer tears leads to dry eyes. When the eyes feel like gritty and like there's something lodged there. Eyes also get tired after a lot of reading. Less saliva leads to dry mouth. The mouth often feels uncomfortable or stings and people have difficulty chewing and swallowing food. These symptoms of dryness often also affect other parts of the body, such as the nose, upper airways, the vagina, and skin. 
Fatigue and muscle and joint pains occur in more than 80% of people with this syndrome, leading to a reduced quality of life. In 30 to 40% of people with primary Sjogren's syndrome, other parts of the body are also affected, such as the skin, joints, brain, nerves, lymph nodes, kidneys, hearts, and lungs. There is also a risk of developing non-Hodgkin lymphoma that is roughly 14 times higher than in the general population. Now, Sjogren's syndrome is one of the most common autoimmune illnesses in the primary form that affects about 0.3 to 1.0 per 1,000 individuals. According to the Australian Sjogren's Syndrome Association website, Up to 0.5% of Australians have the condition, considerably more than the international figures. However, this figure needs to be confirmed in a prospective epidemiological study, which has yet to be done. Now, we are at risk for a lot of other conditions that some physicians fail to leave out. It is up to us to find out to do our research and not leave everything on the medical professional because they, in reality, you have some doctors who only have time to tell you so much. And then if you have questions, they'll say, we'll address it at our next visit. That's why it's so important for you to become informed and knowledgeable and to be your own best advocate. Now, the diagnosis for this condition is a challenging one. General symptoms such as unexplained fever, involuntary weight loss, pain, fatigue, and even dryness are not specific to this illness and can delay the diagnosis for years. Inflammation of the muscle, joint, skin, nervous system, kidneys, or lungs, which may lead to organ failure, can also mislead, as this can mimic other diseases such as RA, lupus, or multiple sclerosis. It is also important to distinguish primary Sjogren's syndrome from non-autoimmune conditions such as perimenopause, endocrine disorders, or fibromyalgia, which do not require monitoring or treatment of organs affected by the condition. Finally, defining whether it is primary or secondary disease is not always easy. Primary Sjogren's syndrome syndrome should be suspected in someone with dryness in the mouth, the eyes, joint pain, and or fatigue with or without symptoms of systemic other organ complications. Now, your doctor will perform a detailed clinical examination and run non-invasive tests to measure mouth 
and eye dryness in consultation with a rheumatologist. You will also have a specific blood test to confirm the autoimmune disease. And if that is not conclusive, you may need a biopsy. Just a small sample of the minor salvatory gland. This is a minor dental procedure performed under local anesthetic. It can confirm primary Sjogren syndrome and also exclude other diseases that mimic it and need different therapy. So, if you are diagnosed with lupus, more than likely you will have secondary Sjogren Sjogren syndrome. I'm getting tongue tied. And if you're not diagnosed with an autoimmune, other autoimmune condition, you know that is primary. Um, like I said, there is no cure. Um, as always, it mimics other conditions. It is so important that you get your eyes checked out and let the doctor prescribe artificial tears, um, eye drops to help lubricate your dry eyes. Um, You need to keep your eyelids free from infection. And the most important, we know that Dental health is so important. Regular checkups and fluoride treatments are recommended. As are using sugar-free chewing gum or lozenges to stimulate saliva production. I've talked about medications that were given to me from my rheumatologist to produce saliva. I have lozenges that I use um, that I put right on um, the upper gum and it sits there and it produces saliva. It's over the counter. But make sure that you go to the dentist. We know that um, one of our biggest main concerns when having a chronic illness is the decaying of our teeth, especially with lupus and Sjogren's, okay? And it's important that we get our regular dental exams. It is necessary for us to get fluoride treatments. Um, I know, notice that I have to um, change my toothpaste regularly because I was using one toothpaste that was causing my mouth to erupt in oral ulcers. So I had to switch to, I have to say the name, Sensodyne toothpaste. And I also have fluoride treatments, which are not covered by my insurance. So check with your insurance first. I paid $20 for my fluoride treatments. And I think it's either three months or six months that I have to get the treatment. So it's $20. Um, I um, take um, and pay for my fluoride treatment. Then it's another procedure I also have done at the dental office, which is not covered. And that's $60. So $80 I'm out of. 
because of the autoimmune conditions that I have. But that's why I raised the topic of the Sjogren syndrome up. And I used um, tennis champion Venus Williams as the example of having Sjogren's syndrome. Stay with me and I'll be back to close out. You know, we are truly living in some crazy times. You know, I sit back and I I watch everything that is happening in this country, around the world, and I'm not going to lie, some days I feel like I am in the twilight zone. Me and a friend had a conversation yesterday. And we were talking about things that are happening in this country and around the world. And I said, it's just like people are just going wow. Everywhere you turn, if someone is not being shot someone is passing away from the virus and I want to ask you because I had to really sit and think about everything that I see, that I hear, and um, I told this individual, I said, never would I have thought that I would be living in a world with all this craziness going on. You know, and I I thought about the people I see on the streets that are homeless. I I wonder, do they have families? Where are they, their families? How we once had... um, medical facilities that would treat those with mental health issues and they closed down these medical facilities and didn't even care what happened to the people who were receiving help from them. It's something to think about. That someone, sister, brother, child, uncle, niece, nephew, husband, wife, cousin, auntie, whatever the case may be. And if there has ever been a day that we need the power of God manifested in our lives is today. See, we can't try to get by on our own strength any longer. We need help. You know... that the Bible is God speaking to us. The word of God is the will 
of God. You know, the Bible states, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be open unto you. For every one that asketh, receiveth, and he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. No matter what you go through, all you have to do is ask. And you shall be given. You know, I pray throughout the day and at night. And I pray to see, to live long enough to see a better world. Because what I see right now is chaos destruction every day it's always something new so I ask of you to pray for this country because as my father used to say we're living in some terrible times right now Never would I have thought that I would live long enough to see this country in the shape that it is in. So I'm asking you to pray like I pray. That God turns it around and show up and show out for this country. I'm Susan Hendricks, your host for my story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I pray that you have a safe and oh so blessed weekend. I'll see you next week for another episode. Thank you for listening.